Hi, everyone. We're going to go ahead and start. So thank you all so much for coming this evening. My name is Laura Minton, and I am the curator of exhibitions at the Freeland Museum of Art. And first, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of Virginia and the city of Charlottesville stand on the territory and homelands of the Monacan Nation. And we pay our respect to their elders past, present, and emerging. So tonight, we are very excited to welcome Toki Rome Taylor, whose work was featured in our exhibition last fall, Power Play, Reimagining Representation in Contemporary Photography. And this was a show that was co-curated by me, Hannah Catterin, assistant curator, and Adriana Gretchen Green, curator of Indigenous Arts of the Americas, who are both here this evening. And two of Toki's works from our collection are on view downstairs, if you'd also like to see those after the talk. Special thanks to the Arts Endowment, through the Office of the Provost and the Vice Provost for the Arts for sponsoring this event, and so many of my Fraylin colleagues who helped plan this. Just a quick reminder to please turn your cell phones on silent, and if you'd like to ask a question for the Q&A, please write it down on one of the cards we have um, over there on the small table by the door, and we'll collect those at the end of the talk. I also want to invite all of you to a small reception with Toki following that will take place downstairs after. And now for the main event. So I'm, <laughs> I'm the, main event. the main event. So I'm so pleased to introduce Toki Rome Taylor. Toki is an Atlanta-based photographer who constructs lavish portrait scenes, melding the compositions and styles of European wealth and status with elements of African diasporic material culture. Through her ethnographic and historical research, she investigates the symbolic meanings of objects, spirituality, family, and memory. The photographs defy the erasure of people of color depicted in art and their inaccurate or subjugated portrayal. The children in her photographs exude ancestral knowledge, wisdom, power, and beauty, and represent the interwoven connections between past, present, and future. Toki received a BA from Morris Brown College and an MA in education from Lesley University. She has received numerous grants and awards for her work and has exhibited nationally and internationally in solo and group exhibitions at places like Atlanta Contemporary, the Chicago Museum for Innovation and Technology, the Freyland Museum, <laughs> the Southeastern Museum of Photography, the Griffin Museum of Photography, SP Photo, SP Art Fair in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and the Zuckerman Museum of Art, among many others. Please join me in welcoming Toki Rome Taylor. I'm listening and I'm like, oh wow, that sounds really interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just going to jump right in. Um, and hopefully I'm not messing up their setup. Um, so m the original stance that I've always taken in creating the artwork is that <clears throat> one's understanding begins in childhood. And so all of the work that I create centers children. Your perception and your sense of belonging begins in childhood, and that is formed by what you experience um, through what you see, what you hear, and where you see yourself. And so I've always worked with this notion that my children and children of color needed to see themselves in spaces and places that are valued by a society and by a community. And that was something that I missed growing up. I'm from Atlanta. And growing up in Atlanta, I did not see artwork that reflected me in institutional or museum spaces. And so that kind of sticks with you. And it makes this subconscious, because <clears throat> of course somebody's doing it deliberately, supposedly. Um, <laughs> there's this subconsciousness that you are an outsider, that you don't belong, that this is for them, and you can see, but you are not a participant. And so I've worked with children my entire life. Um, and within that work, I've always had to kind of create the sense of safety for them. And so that sense of safety extends to the artwork that I create. <clears throat> um, thank you, because I can't see over there. Thank you. Um, I 
offer a counter narrative to how African Americans or Africans from the diaspora have been depicted within artwork. Um, questions that stem from ethnography. Ethnography is the research or study of how a society lived. For me, the ethnography is how did my ancestors who were brought over, how, how did they live in these spaces and places? Um, I'm looking at material, spiritual, and familiar culture of descendants of individuals who were brought over through slavery. Um, I'm from the South. My ancestors are from the South. And if I go back far enough, I hit a wall. I hit a wall because there is, there is no documentation of my lineage beyond a certain point. And that is not something that happens across all cultures. It happens specifically with African Americans. And so you're always, as an African American who, who's a descendant of slaves, you're always looking for these threads of connection. And so that's a part of the work as well. <clears throat> um, I came across this piece. Um, it's by Mene, I wanna say. Yes. And so within this work that Mene produced, you have um, her, you have these peonies, and you have this vase. All of them are representative of objects. She is not in the image or the painting as a, um, a person of importance, of value. Her value is in her body, is in her placement with these expensive flowers, this expensive vase, they are all commodities. And so that is the narrative of Africans who are brought over that exists in Western cultural canons of art. And that is a narrative that many of us who are in this current time are trying to change, me being amongst them. Um, so for me, our bodies are artifacts. And when I say our bodies are artifacts, you think about we are containers of DNA and all of the people who have existed before us. Thus, we are artifacts. Um, everything that has been passed down to us, whether we know it or not, exists in our DNA. It also exists in stories and memories. Um, I use a lot of symbolism within the work. Um, the symbolism comes into play via lace, feathers, vessels, beads, halos, and buttons. And they are a personal uh, language for me to talk about my history and the history of others. Um, within this piece, you see the, the row of cowrie shells leading back to the lace, you see the vessel that has the buttons and the cowrie shells. I'll go into detail and speak about <clears throat> the materiality and what it represents. For me, the cowrie shells are <clears throat> a, they've always been in African cultures, been used as a means of adornment. Um, they are used in religious ceremonies. They are used as a decorative item. They've also been used as a means of um, money. And so there's a layered meaning in their use and in the value placed within them. Um, the lace is this connection to the Western culture. I am a descendant of slaves in the West, not in Africa, not in West Africa, I'm not in Nigeria, none of that. I'm a descendant of slaves and that happens because of the West. And so lace for me is <clears throat> a bit of a representation of that Western um, narrative, but it's a narrative that can't be erased. It's <clears throat> history should not be erased. Sh history should be told in its entirety and in, in, in a wholeness. Whether good or bad, I would not be here if it was not for that transatlantic slave trade, right? And so I'm here and I acknowledge that history. 
Um, the pearls, um, I did a talk with students earlier and they're like, what's the importance of the pearls? Um, for me, the pearls are indicative and representative of the journey. Um, pearls come from the ocean, um, this journey that we as enslaved Africans had to cross the ocean. Um, we also are a culture who enjoys adorning themselves. That is a tradition. And so in the West, what I had to think about, what would be the traditional adornment in the West? And I think about pearls being that. And I think about, well, they don't have access to African bees. What will be that substitution? And so you'll see pearls utilized a lot in the work as well. <clears throat> You'll see um, objects within the works. Um, in this particular piece, I get it a lot. Oh, it's a globe he's holding. It's not a globe. It is an ostrich egg. And the ostrich egg is something my husband um, brought back from South Africa. And it has the big six engraved on it. Um, for a lot of African Americans, we did not have the luxury of passing down artifacts, and so that is a major um, tenet of the work. The examination of artifacts, whether real or imagined, and when I say real, of course, these are passed down heirloom items, but sometimes an heirloom has to be, an, has to be imagined. What would have been passed down? What could hold a story? For me, an artifact is a vessel and a, a touch point to hold the story. And so with a lot of the families that I worked with, they did not have a physical artifact identified. And so it became this conversation of how do we create an artifact? We create an artifact by identifying story and what object either that you have or that we can use within the artwork to represent that story. Um, <clears throat> for this particular sitter, she said, Toki, we, we just have a, a story of tragedy and hard scratch and, and, the, and the only way we made it through was through education and through knowledge. And so the piece is called Rebirth because that is not her, her son's story. Her son's story is a mother and a father who love him, who have protected him. Um, you see, um, you have warriors in the background. I, I very much enjoy layering, um, not just objects and fabrics, but also images together. You have the warriors um, in the background protecting him, and he's holding this, um, this, this ostrich egg, and it's a rebirth of his story. Um, concepts of theme, um, time, memory, uh, spirituality, um, identity. The body is a reservoir of history. It is a reservoir of memory. The tradition of passing down story from person to person, if you don't identify the artifact in the family, and the story doesn't get told about the artifact, if the person is gone too soon, then the history can get lost. It can be changed, it can be perverted. There are folks who currently are trying to pervert history and change what actually happened. And so for me, it is critical that I identify those objects. And, and, and just for just regular people, we are putting story into artifact and carrying those stories forward. This particular piece, she's holding this photograph of her grandparents and reflecting on it. Um, the children ask me, where do, you, where do you get your ideas from? And so I do a lot of research. Um, I am inspired by the family stories of the sitters um, that I work with. I am inspired by um, African spiritual practices and that overlap with Christianity, because once again, it is this amalgamation and blending of cultures that is reflective of the history of the South. Um, I, I read historical and archeological accounts of people who were kidnapped and brought over as slaves. 
Um, I look at family accounts and their family heirlooms and memorabilia. And I also truly love a good writer. Um, sometimes when you don't have the words, some writer has already pulled them together for you and it just resonates with you and it speaks to the work you were already doing visually, but they've done it in words. And so, um, great lover of Toni Morrison, Imani Perry, um, Octavia Butler, and Jaster. Jaster is the go-to place for research for me. <laughs> um, so I will often ar uh, incorporate archival photographs within the work. Thank you, dear. And oftentimes that, that research in and of itself will take a couple days because I'm trying to pull works that point one aren't under copyright and that you know I'm stealing somebody else's work and integrating it with my own. I don't believe in that. Um, so I'm very mindful. And so that's a part of the process as well, just researching not just writing, but researching imagery. Um, so this is how this piece was made. One of the kids asked, how long does it take you? I said, uh, so three, four days, sometimes, I don't know. <laughs> So clearly I use Photoshop, yeah. It's not a straight photo, but yeah, that, that's the process. Um, so for me, the photograph, I liken the, the raw photograph to be like a painter's tube of paint or a printmaker and their carving tools. The photograph for me is material to work with and I manipulate that material. And so I definitely go back in into the photograph and work it after I've created it. But a part of me creating it is sourcing the objects that'll be in the scene, um, creating the tableau, um, using, I'll, I'll use lots of velvets, I like layering, making sure that the outfits of the sitter fit my vision. There's no specific time period that I'm going for. It's always just a lean into the past with maybe a jump over to slight futurism, but there's no time period because the world that these children existed in in the past did not exist. So yeah, um, I also do encaustic work, which is like a wax medium. Um, in cyanotype, as well as embroidery on the work. So I, I'm really interested in the materiality of the medium itself um, and working with photographs. Um, I can play the video of me just, just setting up and lighting, um, but I usually use like one or two lights. Um, the field is a foam board, and I just, like my studio is pretty small. It's not a fancy studio, just work with it. Or skip, yeah, play it later. I don't want to watch it. Yeah. Oh my god, okay, okay. That sounds so weird, okay. So this is a typical studio setup. I've got my bounce for feel on this side. So it's just two boards. And then I've got an Einstein Halsey Buff um, light with a Fotex soft lighter. This is, a, I believe, a 36 inch Fotex, um, which has two layers of diffusion on it. Um, if you have a bigger studio space, of course, you can get a bigger light, but my studio space is relatively small, so I work with, and it has low ceilings, so I work with what I have. Um, it is sitting on a C-stand, and the C-stand allows me to move it around a little bit easier, and the C-stand's on wheels. We've got the setup for the sitter. Um, the light itself is typically going to be at a 45 degree angle as far as positioning and I angle it slightly away from the sitter so that they're getting the edge of the light hitting them and not being blasted in the face. What that does is it's going to create some shadows on their skin and on their clothing and it's also going to create highlights at the same time. And what the, the fill light will do is fill in those shadows on the side 
of them. And so it creates a lot more dimension than if the light was directly at them and filling in all the shadows. Um, I also have another light back here. Sorry. And this light is acting as a light for the background and it's acting as a feel, as a hair light um, for the subject. And so that's just typical setup here. Um, let's go and look at editing. That was that same setup. That's the same lighting setup. Yeah. I, I'll fiddle with some light until I it just it looks right to me. But then I'm gonna go in and stack some layers into it. Cause yeah. And so this is how I make my sets. I have a bare bones studio. And it's just a couple, like a minute, but this is probably three hours <laughs> of me fiddling and I didn't like something, taking it down, putting it back up. My husband like, you finish that? No, dude, go away. So lots of velvet, lots of fabric, lots of layers. It creates dimensionality within the photograph. Yeah. No secrets, it's not rocket science, just. And so these are, this is like one of my sitters. And I, I'm an army of one. So everything you see from creating the sets to source and outfits, the way they're styled, I do all of it. And so that's the, the work. Like that's the back of the camera, but Wait on it, though. Wait on it, folks. That's the work. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's the work. But, and the story behind this, I asked the sitters if they have artifacts to bring them in. And for her, it was one of those, it, they were okay. They were okay. They, they weren't my photographs. Anybody else would have been perfectly happy with them, but it was not magic. There some a couple good ones, but it, there was not magic for me. And then her mom reminded us that, hey, I, I have my great-grandmother's spoon. We haven't used it yet. And so we incorporated the great-grandmother's spoon, and it was like, boom. And so this piece is called, We Come to Stir the Pot. And I was like, yo, I don't know what's in that spoon, but great grandmama, great grandma is channeling right now. And so that, that is the importance of artifacts. It keeps people alive, it keeps their story alive, it keeps that connection. I don't know if she's ever made, met her great grandmother, but there was something magical that happened when we incorporated it into what we were doing. Um, and this is just a little bit be like behind the curtain. There's usually anywhere between 20, 40 layers. Like I will sit and nobody will see some of the stuff that I take out or dodge burn, whatever. They're not gonna see it. I know they're not gonna see it, but I see it. I can't help myself. 
I have to, it has to look right for me, even though I know most people will not see the level of detail address that I put into it. But it's important for me that I see it as perfect or as perfect as I can make it. Um, this is my daughter, Zoe. Um, this, we created this during COVID. Like, it was one of those um, moments where COVID is happening. We, every artist I know, we're on Zoom and Instagram, and we're at a standstill, but the standstill created this moment where everybody had time to read, everybody had time to research, everybody had time to create if you wanted to. And so I took the time to read, to research. So let's go downstairs, I have an idea. And so the piece is called Preparation of a Seer. It's for her, but it was also for me because the preparation of a seer, a seer is a person who has vision, who has knowledge beyond the reality of now. It's something I desire for her, but it was something that I felt was happening for me. And so there's this other layer that, I didn't have a fancy fabric, it's literally this little piece of um, decorative paper I had and I just dropped it over and blended it in, but yeah, I think it's like 20 layers or so, I don't know, 30, who knows. Um, I enjoy stitching on the photographs. I don't do as many of these as I would like because they're really time consuming, but I love the, the finish of it. Um, it's that combination of materiality, um, yeah. So you'll see the mother of pearl beads or buttons. You'll see them in the work as well. Um, for me, buttons are conjure objects, particularly mother of pearl um, buttons. They are conjure objects. They are a means of control. And <coughs> the whole narrative or this, this notion of the buttons being a means of control, I was reading this article about the Hermitage um, plantation Andrew Jackson's president, plantation. He owned over 100 slaves. And they started ex excavating the site and what they would find in the slave quarters, in the corners of the homes, they would find um, these pearl buttons, um, not pearl, uh, mother of pearl buttons. They would find little bits of metal, pins, and so, the speculation with the ethnographers was that these were the continuation of spiritual practice left over or retained, I should say, retained by these individuals. And if you know anything about African spiritual practice, not, not that I, I practice it or anything, I, I really look at it from a academic standpoint and from an informational, I, I'm learning standpoint, because it's not something that we are taught. I'm from the South, Southern Baptist, right? And so it's not something that you're taught. Um, the conversation is that when you have an object from a person, it gives you control over them. And so these individuals who had no control of their day-to-day -day movements, their children, none of it, they had no control. If they could gain a button or a piece of metal from this person who was trying to control their every movement. It gave them control over their spiritual world. And so I look at buttons as a conjure object where these individuals who had no control over their lives could retain some spiritual control and perhaps now have their child sold away, perhaps not get beaten. Just the, the speculation of the hopefully, because you have to have some level of hope in a situation like that, or you, you're not gonna survive, and they did. And so, for me, the mother pearl buttons are conjure objects. Um, 
Um, another process that I really enjoy is called Cyanotype. Um, Cyanotype is a contact print method of creating an image. You take two chemicals, um, separate it, they're not UV sensitive, they do nothing. Yeah. But you blend them together in the correct ratio and you coat your substrate, whether that, it has to be a natural substrate, cotton, um, linen, whatever, it has to just be natural. And you let it dry and then you, whatever you put on top, it will create an image. A lot of people will put plants on top, but for me, I put the raw material of a, of a digital negative. I put the digital negative on top. And then you wash it with water. You wash it clean. And what you have is what remains. You have what is important, what should be kept, right? And so that's why I love this cyanotype process. Um, yeah, you get to keep the important stuff and the rest just washes away. Um, for this particular image, um, their family's history is that of soldiers. So what they brought in was this, this statue um, that one of their family members had been gifted, I think it was like a grandparent, had been gifted um, to denote their service to the military. And so that is what they valued and wanted to be um, captured within the work. And he makes offering. The, um, making offering is a spiritual tradition to ancestors. It acknowledges them, it feeds them, it keeps them alive. And in return, they stay with you. They give you guidance. And so, yeah, he makes offering. This particular piece is just um, layers of silk. The back layer is cotton. And the, in front of that is the, the threads. Once again, we're talking about threads of connection. And then we have the cowrie shells and uh, the buttons holding on to that connection. The deal with cyanotype, your negative has to be the same size as what you want the finished image to be. And so you're only limited by the negative you can print and <laughs> for me, the exposure unit size, but because I use an exposure unit, but you can use a sun. Um, but you want the contact to be tight or it's not gonna be sharp. And so that's a negative that I created for the piece you just saw. Um, this is me washing for this piece, and so I'll just hit play. to wash it over and over again to get the chemicals out that haven't been exposed. So that's them drying. They dry darker than what you see. And so that's that piece. You say all you want to be is remember. This far, good job, people. Great job. <laughs> Questions, comments. I hope I didn't bore you. <laughs> Thank you. 
right, so if, we, if you want to have a question for Toki, we actually have cards um, to fill out. So actually, I'm going to cheat and ask the first question um, while <laughs> we can kind of collect the questions from you all. But my question is really, is there a medium you're excited to kind of expand more into, you know, after Ooh. cyanotypes or yes. being caustic? Yes. <laughs> my limitation is time. <laughs> Time, time, time. So I've got three pieces that are already prepped for printing on vellum and gold leafing the vellum. So that's in the pipeline. And then I've got all the materials set aside for me doing the embroidery, more of the embroidery work, because like I said, it's really time consuming but I love the way it looks when it's finished. And so that's where I'm gonna be spending my next couple months time, yeah. yeah. I'm kind of burnt on Sienna because I've been doing Sienna type for this exhibition that I was doing. So I'm gonna take a little step back and shift to those other two mediums, yeah. All right, so we have a question about um, who are your models? How do you find your models? Great question. Um, <clears throat> so quite a few of the models are my kids. Um, I have five kids, four of which are at the house right now, my husband who's so patient. Um, and so they will be incorporated within the works. I also will you know, talk to my friends and incorporate their children. And then I will reach out to individuals. Um, I'll, I'll just make like a post on Facebook. It's, why not, right? But it's a almost, I, I don't want to say it's an interview process, but it is me making sure that the narrative that I'm creating, they're okay with it. Because particularly Southern people can be sensitive about the exploration that I do in regards to spirituality. Um, I make sure that you know I'm I'm not indoctrinating your children. It, it it really is an art, artistic practice, and so I make sure that I'm clear in the message and the narrative that I'm going to be creating with their children. And I've never had anybody tell me no, but I'm always very very clear in what I'm saying with the work, and their children are within this work, and so from there we start a deeper conversation, but that's pretty much how um, I get the sitters, yeah. And what do the sitters think of the final photographs? <sighs> they love it, yeah, that's like an easy answer. They love it. Um, the parents, sometimes they cry, um, and it's, for me that's a little bizarre because I'm not a crier, but I get the emotion <laughs> that is, you know, induced by artwork. Um, but they're, they're usually very, very pleased and they understand the value in what I've created because oftentimes, if I have an exhibition, I'm inviting them to come see the exhibitions. And so it directly correlates to what I experienced as a child. I did not see myself in those spaces and these kids literally see themselves in museum spaces, yeah. It's a direct impact. All right, we've got, um, you mentioned the importance of layering materials and influences. Can you say a little more about the role of storytelling in your work too? Yes. Um, it's all a story. I think really strong artists that I'm drawn to are storytellers. Um, the artwork holds the story. Um, I had a question earlier, does the story come first for you, Toki, or um, do you just create the art? It, it, it's a back and forth. Like, like I said, I'll read something and a story will come to me or it connects to something I'm already exploring in the back of my mind and then I get a visual. And that visual is a visual artist's representation of the story. And so for me, first and foremost, I'm a storyteller who uses artwork to tell the story versus text, yeah. 
What is something in your work that's bringing you joy? Say it again. What is something in your work that is bringing you joy? Something in my work that is bringing me joy? I don't know how to answer that. Um, I enjoy the process of making the work, but I'm also always super happy to say something's finished. So, yeah. <laughs> Right, we've also got, um, do you think you'll end up using teens or young adults as your sitters or even maybe elderly people or other adults as well? I think that's a possibility because I see myself making work for years and years and years. And so you can never say what the evolution of your work is going to look like, but it will always center children as a part of that narrative. Yeah. And we've also got, how does your teaching practice influence your art or, and vice versa? Um, so I've been teaching 24 years and 16 slash 17 of those years have been in high school. And I've been making for myself approximately, sorry, six or seven for myself, but mentally, when you hold high, uh, conversations with high schoolers and you're trying to coach them along and mentor them, you say, well, what about this idea? What about that idea? And I teach in high school, so they don't take it. Like they, most of the time they, they were ignoring my ideas. And I'm like, oh no, that was a great idea. And so I had all of these piled up ideas that I wasn't executing, but every time I'm, I'm, I'm coming up with these ideas. And so I've been idea generating for a really long time. And so I've got this whole backlog of concepts and images that I just have to bring to reality. I think I lost the question in the conversation, but oh, how is teaching influenced? So I think in that respect, teaching for so long and having to work uh, in conversation and explain the concepts that I, I was trying to get them to, to see and they just weren't seeing it, that helps me in being able to communicate my vision and what I am trying to execute. So definitely in that light, mm, did I answer the question? I don't know. Okay, I think I did. All right, this is a two-part question. First part, what's your Instagram, if you have one, and your other socials? And second part, what are you working on that's new? Um, Instagram and Facebook, it's Toki T Studio. Um, you can just look my name up on LinkedIn. Those are the three platforms I'm on. Twitter's kind of dead for me. Yeah. Um, and my website is there as well. Um, I just finished publishing, self-published, um, a book um, that has the artwork in it as well as the narratives from my sitters. It's their family stories. It's the artifacts that we've incorporated. Um, and that's available on the website as well. As far as what am I working on next? I gotta get to those gold leafing pieces that are on vellum. Um, definitely wanna spend time um, embroidering the photographs. I have an exhibition coming up at Austin Pay University in the fall. And uh, working on something in North Carolina in 2024, but we got work through the logistics, yeah. And then I have um, a piece that'll be in San Francisco? I don't know, it's, I don't know, it's the Rolodex. Oh, and I'm teaching a class at Penland um, in the summer from May 28th to, that, whatever that is, May 28th, it's a one week workshop on Cyanotype, so yeah, I'll get to share my process with those guys, it's pretty fun. I got one more here. How do you get the word out about your work? So you guys are helpful. <laughs> <laughs> but 
no, um, I will tell any artist, I utilize Instagram as a business tool. And so for me, I use Instagram as a Rolodex of individuals that I want to make connections with, of um, to allow people to see my work. I don't post as many photos these days because people are taking photos and yeah, anyway. But I do, I'll try and do like video of process and people really like process videos anyway. And so that allows folks to see, particularly as a photographer, that the process of me creating is multi-layered and it's not a check a one, two, push the button kind of situation. Um, I also have a website. Um, I make sure the website is clean. I make sure it's easy to navigate. Everything you need is on the website if you are interested in learning more about me and the work. Um, yeah. Great. I just want to thank you all for coming. We're going to do a small reception downstairs. We have a few receptions. You can see Toki's work. And Let's give her another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.